So the next um, discussion is led by, uh, uh, yes, Ben Monster, Jarich, Mate, and Peter Taylor on the origin of the scatter of the semiconductor astrolation and Ramy dependencies. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks a lot actually to, to having this reunion. So um, it's great that uh, thanks to the organizers for, for having us here. Um, so we were talked about, uh, asked to talk about the origin of the scatter in the stellar to halo mass relation and also the secondary dependencies other than halo mass, right? So um, I'm really glad that we can actually talk about this because this is a, a topic that's sometimes overlooked and, you know, usually um, what people do is talk about the average stellar to halo mass relation, but um, yeah, there is scatter in the relation. And the way we're going to approach this is that I will give you a rough overview and some of my points uh, from the empirical modeling side. Then you will take over and uh, give us more insight into hydrodynamical simulation and uh, you know what the scatter in the hydrodynamical simulation where it comes from and what it tells us. And Ned, in the end, will give a look. Well, he calls it also empirical. Um, I would more call it. Uh, if for me, it's more on the observational side, so we'll give a, a look at uh, lensing results and then wrap it all up uh, and conclude. Okay, so let me start with uh, okay. uh, asking where is the scatter actually important, because, you know, we know the, the primary property that, of course, drives the stellar mass um, is the virial mass and the halo, but, of course, we also now know that there are secondary properties that then lead to the scatter in the stellar halo mass relation. For example, um, you know, not all halos have the same formation history, so they will all have a different concentration. And as the second property, you know, the, the stellar mass then will be higher or lower. Then, of course, also the environment might make a big difference if it's in regions where you have a lot of growth, then the stellar mass might be bigger, for example. Or um, there might be other properties, for example, spin could be one. Um, so, um, but there's a big question mark behind that, of course, but also there, are, there may be other properties. So the way we've done that before is, of course, uh, with, with these simple empirical models, for example, with abundance matching is we just took the observational results, for example, here from Sohut Mora. Um, this was uh, from satellite kinematics, and this gave us, you know, this, this typical number of 0.15 to 0.2 dex of scatter at fixed halo mass. And um, yeah, then, of course, the idea is that uh, the, the scatter, of course, is, it was just taken by hand, but in, 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 uh, you know, in the real universe, the scatter actually could tell us something about the underlying physics. And you know, this, this kind of reminds me a bit on a talk I gave a long time back on an older model. This was also abundance matching based. So we had these predictions on, you know, stellar to halo mass and for the average relation. And then we overplotted all these different hydrodynamical zoom simulations. And uh, at that time, you know, at redshift zero, they were already uh, cooled down a lot and, you know, gave the, the roughly the right stellar masses. But at the high redshift, they were really high. And then the answer I often got was uh, like, oh, you know, we just picked or we, we happen to have picked the system that in the end has a, uh, you know, is, is up, uh, upwards on the scatter. So it just has an untypically high stellar mass. But of course, this is all because we have just so num low number of systems. So this has now gotten a lot better now. The hydrodynamical simulations now do really well on the stellar to halo mass relation, um, you know, from low to high redshift. But this actually then tells us also something we can, we can learn something about the physics and we can, um, compare models more directly if we understand the scatter properly. So I hope I convinced you that scatter is actually an important thing to understand. Okay, then um, now from my empirical modeling side, the way we've usually done it, I've said it before, we've uh, had just an average relation between stellar and halo mass, you know, for example, in abundance matching. But the, the newer models, and this goes for our model Emerge, but also for uh, models like Universe Machine, Steel, and others, the, the idea is that um, now you can actually look at individual growth histories. And what we now parameterize is not any more the ratio between stellar mass and halo mass, but the ratio between star formation rate and halo growth rate. This is done slightly differently in other models, but this is the general idea. And we called it uh, instantaneous um, conversion efficiency, which typically depends, of course, on halo mass, but may also depend on redshift. And the idea is then, so here you see halo mass as a function of uh, redshift, and you know different halos have different tracks through that uh, through that plane. 
And when the halo, for example, this massive halo here crosses this uh, very high efficiency in the background, then this is where its star formation rate, of course, peaks. And so then it has formed most of its stars and until the end. Okay, then in the end, there is, uh, you can then look at what, what this formula says, uh, that tells us. So the difference in stellar mass is actually the uh, given by what's coming in. So this is the material that's actually becoming available uh, within, to, to the halo in a snapshot. And then the efficiency here tells you how efficiently this material is then converted into stars at the bottom of the dark matter halo. Okay, so with that, um, we, we turn, uh, so this um, uh, efficiency here is parameterized and we uh, fit it on a num uh, number of observations like stellar mass function, cluster, local clustering, um, star formation, uh, stellar mass relations and so on. And then we get uh, a model and we automatically then get the scatter in here in our model. So we have, uh, you know, at fixed halo mass, you get the scatter uh, out automatically at reg from reg uh, 0.1 to 1. And the question now is why actually in this model does it come out like that? And you can just look at, um, you just integrate this, uh, the star formation history. So the stellar mass is just the integral of the star over the star formation rate. I know there's stellar mass loss, but let's forget about that in this very simple picture now. And then this means um, we can write then the star formation rate again as the growth rate times this efficiency. And now if this efficiency doesn't depend on anything else but halo mass, we can take it out of the integral and we just can integrate here the growth rate, which gives us the final halo mass. And we've arrived with something that's, you know, just depends on halo mass again. So an efficiency, this might be this double power law again, times the virial mass in the end. And so there is no scatter in the relation like that. So what's crucial here is that um, the efficiency does actually also depend on secondary properties like the redshift. And for example, here to, to walk you through that again, I've painted here two dark matter halos that both are 10 to the 14 solar masses at redshift zero. But one grows early, the other late. And the one that grows early actually goes through that very high efficiency we find that the halos have at the at high redshift. And the other one actually goes through this peak here um, at lower redshift where the efficiency has already dropped a bit. And you see then the star formation peaks are um, slightly, uh, somewhat different. So this uh, at its peak forms way more stars than this guy. And if you then integrate over that, you find that the stellar mass in the end is higher in the one that formed early. So um, just this is just an example how different formation histories might then lead to scatter in the stellar to halo mass relation. And of course, there might be more properties that the efficiency depends on and which would just introduce you additional scatter. Okay, so what we find here actually with our model is that, um, you know, the, the halos that form earlier tend to then host more massive galo, uh, galaxies. Moreover, those halos then, because, you know, they formed their bulk of the stars early, so they run out, uh, the efficiency runs out late. Um, so they're typically more passive today, which in our model means that passive galaxies tend to have more um, massive, gal uh, uh, um, sorry, passive galaxies tend to be more massive at fixed halo mass. Now going on, um, this then, if, if, if you look at other pro uh, halo properties, for example, directly the halo concentration, which correlates well with the formation um, time of the halo, you can see the same trend. Um, so for example, here I've plotted the stellar to halo mass relation um, for our model and uh, uh, color coded with concentration. And the halos that form early, so the high concentration ones, they tend to have uh, a more stellar mass in their galaxies. I think Jorod will later show us much more on, on this topic uh, actually in the Eagle simulation. Then uh, another point is we also find that at fixed mass, both at fixed stellar and fixed halo mass, the uh, passive galaxies tend to have higher concentrations than uh, active galaxies, which means they tend to live in older halos, uh, which is um, in principle um, then, then confirming similar things that other people have found like in uh, uh, for example, uh, satellite kinematics, uh, Wojtek and Maman have found this, and uh, Edith Zahavi had a similar uh, result uh, with a uh, HOD uh, or semi-analytic techniques. Okay, then one more point I want to talk about before I hand over is actually inverting the stellar halo mass relation if you have scatter in, or if you take care of the scatter in the relation. There are two points that I want to make. First is there is a uh, scatter even at fixed so at fixed halo mass the, the scatter in m star is not the same for all 
real masses. So people find that. So Annalisa has shown that for TNG. Um, so this is total halo mass. This is scatter at fixed halo mass tends to increase for low halo masses and then stays relatively constant at about these 0.15 to 0.20 dex that satellite kinematics uh, finds as well. And I've just made a similar plot for emerge here where you also see that it does increase with redshift to scatter, but uh, it's fairly constant at the high mass end and then increases significantly towards low masses. So this is already one source of scatter. Um, the other thing is the shape of the stellar to halo mass relation also may lead to um, a different scatter if you invert the relation. So this is from the Wexler and Tinker uh, review. Um, and they show nicely here that this is just abundance matching with a fixed 0.2 deck scatter at fixed halo mass. And you see here, so basically vertical slices here all have the same width here. But um, if you now do uh, horizontal slices through that, you see that uh, the, the, the horizontal width here is much bigger for the massive halos and much smaller for the low mass halos. So you have a reduced scatter here at low mass and increased scatter here at high masses. This goes in hand then with uh, saying that uh, if you in invert those relations, because you know you have way more galaxies down here which scatter upwards than galaxies here that scatter downwards. So if you invert this relation and uh, compute the average halo mass at fixed stellar mass, you will have actually you will find that the relations are not completely identical, and that um, well at fixed halo mass again the relation is somewhat higher if you've been in fixed stellar mass. Okay, a bit complicated, but I think people get it. And to wrap up, what I want to say is we can also do that now for active and passive galaxies. So the idea is um, we, we've, we did find in our model that at fixed halo mass, red galaxies tend to be more uh, slightly more massive. But um, if you now bin the same thing in fixed, uh, in, uh, in fixed stellar mass, you see here blue color coded is uh, active galaxies, red is passive galaxies. And you see here, if you do it at fixed um, halo mass, the blue ones are low, have a lower stellar mass. But if you've been at fixed stellar mass, you see because there's a lot of galaxies scattering up from here, you have a, a lower um, halo mass for these blue or pass uh, active galaxies. And this means that this has these three reasons. There are more active galaxies down here. The scatter is larger here, which we found previously. And of course, because of the stellar mass function, there are way more galaxies that can actually scatter up here. So overall, this causes uh, a fix, uh, the, the, at fixed stellar mass, um, uh, a, a lower average fixed stellar mass for the active galaxies. This actually then, fits nicely together with the observations, both from lensing here, but also from satellite kinematics, that the fixed stellar mass red galaxies actually tend to live in more massive halos. Okay, and I will now hand over to Jorit, who will tell us more about Scatter in Eagle. Thank you. Okay, and stop. All right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So I was actually not at the original meeting, so I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Jorik Matej. I'm a Zwicky Fellow at ETH in Zurich. Um, so yes, I'll present some res results on the origin of scatter in the stellar mass halo mass relation, and also a bit on the star formation rate stellar mass relation, because it's somewhat correlated. Um, and this is from observations, really, of uh, uh, hydro simulations, in particular uh, EAGLE. And I just want to note that I will only discuss central galaxies here. So this is ignoring uh, satellites throughout the entire uh, talk. Um, so yeah, so Eagle, like other simulations, uh, such as illustrious TNG, um, the central galaxies lie on the stellar mass halo mass relation, uh, shown in this, in this plot. Um, and as Ben just showed, and I'll just repeat it here with a slightly larger version, indeed the scatter at fixed halo mass increases towards lower stellar masses, and Eagle and Lustrous appear to be quite consistent in that you can compare the blue to the gray line, in particular at lower halo masses. At higher halo masses, uh, the scatter in Eagle is slightly smaller. Um, but yeah, so about investigating the origin of this scatter. So, I think a nice thing about hydrodynamic simulations, um, of course, everything you do is only valid with, within the valid, validity of the simulation. But I think one thing that's quite nice that you can do is that you can try to separate cause from effect. And for understanding the scatter in a, a relation, that is important. So, for example, in this plot, we show the 
stellar mass and halo mass relation, color coded by the concentration. Uh, here it's a simple uh, uh, quantification of concentration. It's made basically the V max over V200, which correlates with the halo concentration very well. Um, but here this concentration is measured in the full baryonic simulation, so including all the uh, star formation feedback and black hole formation, all those effects. Um, but you can see uh, that uh, orthogonal to this mean relation, which is the black line, there's a very strong dependence at fixed halo mass that galaxies or halos that are more concentrated have, have a higher stellar mass. Um, but the problem is that in this baryonic simulation, this could actually both be a cause and an effect, because if a, if a halo forms a galaxy efficiently, um, this will lead to a contraction of the halo, so you actually increase the concentration. Um, so we can circumvent this by actually looking at a dark matter only simulation, um, which for Eagle was run with the same initial conditions and same resolution. And you can actually measure the dark matter halo properties in that simulation, uh, which are not affected by the baryonic effects. And there you can really, if you identify correlations, uh, you, can, you can think about uh, causation really. Um, and what you can see in this plot, it's really the same, it's just the color code that changed. Um, here is the halo concentration measured in the dark matter only simulation. And you still see a dependence uh, with the, the scatter uh, on this color, so on concentration, but the dependence is weaker. Um, and it's also slightly changing it's at this characteristic 10 to the 12 mass. Um, it's slightly uh, weaker than you see in the full baryonic uh, simulation. But this clearly indicates that there's, that there's um, a concentration, uh, which is related to halo formation time, um, contributes significantly to the scatter in the stellar mass halo mass relation. And as we see the, this um, dependence being stronger in the full baryonic simulation, you can interpret this as, so if you have differences in the halo concentration, you will, um, um, the, the stellar mass assembly will be different. Um, a higher mass, a halo at a higher concentration will lead to a galaxy with a higher stellar mass, and this will in turn lead to even uh, an even more concentrated halo, um, which, eventually uh, results in this strong correlation. Um, a consequence of this is that, at because at fixed halo mass, you can see that you can predict stellar mass better if you also account for halo concentration. A uh, consequence of this is that the actual properties that are correlated to binding energy, uh, such as Vmax, um, correlate better with stellar mass than halo mass uh, on itself does. Um, there are actually very similar results seen in illustrious DMG. Um, as, as these ones that I present in, in EGLE. Um, the other thing you can ask is how much scatter in stellar mass is actually due to concentration or formation time. And I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking about concentration and formation time, but they're really very similar because they're so uh, correlated to, to each other. Um, but what you can see if you do a multi-variable uh, regression analysis, you can see that scatter um, decreases because this correlation with the scatter. Uh, due to concentration, but not a lot actually. So even after accounting for the variation in stellar mass due to concentration, uh, the scatter only decreases by 0.5 dex, 0.05 dex uh, or so, which means that this concentration, this uh, only to it adds scatter, but it's actually not a dominant contribution to scatter. Uh, we also look at different halo properties, all in the dark matter only simulation. And you can do the same for all these halo properties. So you can see for concentration and formation time, you see very um, similar results. But for the other halo properties that we measure, and there are a few more, including the uh, traces of environment, such as the number of, number of galaxies within 10 megaparsec or so, um, none of those other properties actually correlates with scatter in the stellar mass halo mass relation. We can only identify a correlation with concentration or formation time. Um, what this may actually imply is that either we are measuring the wrong dark matter only properties, we, we should measure more complicated properties from dark, dark matter only simulations to explain uh, the stellar mass of galaxies to basically to zero scatter. Um, additionally, or alternatively, it could also mean that galaxy formation is actually quite chaotic. So there can be very small changes in dark matter only properties, but the stellar mass as a result can be a factor uh, 0.2 dex, 0.2 three decks almost uh, different, uh, which is, uh, I think, interesting. So, so why does the scatter core concentration? So Ben just shows um, in, in, in their simulations, and 
Um, I think there are actually two um, possible explanations, and they're probably both true, but the question is which one is more true, or which one is more important. Um, so, since concentration correlates with halo formation time, uh, at fixed halo mass, galaxies that are more concentrated will have had more time to form stars. So, they just, that's, that's why they end up with a higher stellar mass. Um, alternatively, you could actually argue that halos that are more bound and have higher concentration are actually that in which stellar feedback is less efficient in expelling ga gas, and then therefore you form more, you form a higher stellar mass. And actually, I only made these plots this week because I thought it would be interesting for this a bit, a bit more detail. So you can actually look at some galaxy properties to test these hypotheses. Um, in the left, I color code the stellar mass halo mass relation with the mass weighted stellar ages, and on the right with the metallicity. Um, actually, for stellar age, there doesn't appear appear to be very strong relation um, between the scatter and age, which it's quite surprising actually to me. Um, on the right, you actually see, particularly at higher masses, that halos that are uh, more com uh, more com or that, that have a higher stellar mass actually also have a higher stellar met metallicity. So perhaps this um, could indicate that um, there has, has been more uh, recycling of gas, um, and therefore the actual binding energy is, is more argument is more important. But of course, this is to be explored. Um, finally, I also want to show a nice benefit of these simulations is that you can actually go trace these galaxies um, back in time. Um, so what we also did was looking at uh, bins of galaxies, of halos, um, bins by halo mass and formation time at redshift zero. Uh, and I'll just show four bins for uh, visualization purposes. So these four bins have a, a low halo mass to a moderate halo mass. And what I'm going to show is the trajectories that the galaxies in these halo mass bins went through the star formation rate stellar mass plane. So this is a way of looking at um, the star formation history. Um, so what you can see here is basically sometimes called the main sequence of galaxies, star formation rate versus stellar mass at redshift zero, and then the colors are the average locations of these bins. Um, and the two points in these colors are the, the halos that have a high formation time or a late formation time. Um, for low masses, you actually see that these bins, these sub-bins are separated uh, in the x direction, which is exactly scatter in the stellar mass halo mass relation that correlates with formation time, so that's why they separate in this, this x direction. But if you actually go to higher masses, the separation is more in the y direction instead of the x direction. It's more that the formation time impacts the star formation rate instead of uh, stellar mass. So you can trace where these galaxies have been coming from, where these halos have been coming from. Um, so, for example, and what you can see is very clearly that the, pa the trajectories of the halos with a very similar halo mass, redshift zero, are quite different depending on the halo formation time. Um, so a halo that formed relatively early um, typically did this fast trajectory of a higher star formation rate um, throughout for, for a long period periods uh, of time. So it's really that this shows, I think, quite nicely that um, both the halo mass and the formation time influence star formation histories. Um, and it's interesting that this actually has an impact on the scatter in the star formation rate stellar mass plane. So when Peter was showing uh, related results, I just added this slide because this is from Eagle, which I think is very consistent with, he, with what he was showing. So this is the uh, specific star formation rate now versus the stellar mass, which is zero, uh, colored with uh, dark matter formation, uh, dark matter halo formation uh, redshift. And you can actually very clearly see at low mass or below the characteristic uh, quenching mass, that the, the, star, the specific star formation rate correlates with halo formation time. So this is like a long-term oscillation mode of galaxies when they move through star formation rate stellar mass plane. That's definitely not uh, stochastic due to some bursts of star formation, but it has to do with this uh, long-term uh, formation time of dark matter halos. You can actually also color code this again with the scatter or the scatter in the Halo mass, stellar mass relation. So I inverted this because I'm looking at fixed stellar mass. And you can actually retrieve this uh, trend uh, to some extent at low masses. Um, Such so that basically the scatter in stellar mass, halo mass relation also knows a bit about the specific star formation rates uh, due to this correlation uh, with formation time. 
It's also very interesting, that's my last remark, is that at high masses, the, the corollary coding actually inverts that um, the position relative to the stellar mass halo mass relation. Um, how that correlates with specific star formation rate depends on mass, and actually not, in ter not only in terms of strength, but also in direction, actually. Um, so I'm actually not sure about time, so I'm just going to leave with my summary, and um, I'm happy to give the floor uh, to Ned to talk about uh, empirical results from, from lensing. All right. Great. So I'll, I'll dive in and I guess someone tell me on the chat if there's a problem. So um, having, Ben, having started with, with his style of empirical approach, um, I'm coming at this from a, from a, a more purely um, observational side, but I should start by saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, even at 2 a.m., I'm really pleased to be um, joining this, this um, this event, it's awesome, especially because this is this is work that I've been um, uh, working towards for the last four or five years. But it's only just really recently that it's kind of that it's coming to fruition, which is really awesome. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, as I said, what I want to talk about is is how how to come at this from a, a wholly observational standpoint, um, which lets you ask questions of the form. Um, uh, what is the best predictor of halo mass and vice versa. Um, so let me start essentially picking up a bit on, on um, what Ben has said, which is looking at how abundance matching or halo occupation um, works to constrain the stellar to halo mass relation. And, and to make this too simplistic, what you do is you start at the top with a halo mass function, you adopt some trial for the stellar, for the, for the bivariate distribution function between halo mass and stellar mass, and then compute the other marginal, which is the, the stellar mass function, which you can compare back to observations. And the point when you look at this, uh, and again, this is something that Ben was, was pointing towards as well, is that your strongest constraint at the high mass end is actually the fall off of the stellar mass function. And it gives you a degeneracy between the scatter at high masses and the slope at high masses. So imagine just cranking up the scatter and what you'll do is you'll blow out the massive end of the mass function so to combat that, you'll need to bring down the slope. Um, the other thing I'll say is that this, this kind of double power law is really a generic feature that's, that comes about trying to match the kind of power law halo mass function to the Schechter function, stellar mass function. So basically, just that, that abundance matching style approach um, uh, you know, that leads that generic prediction of this, this um, double power law. And it's very hard to get additional data to take you beyond that. Um, and so um, I should, well, yeah, and so, so even weak lensing, um, which gives you, has the ability to constrain things at the low mass end, it struggles to bring additional information at the high mass end where the, the number density constraint really dominates. So what I'm trying to do is, is trying to, all right, well, what can you do with observations? And the idea that I want to focus on is what I've done is essentially taken, I'm focusing just on a narrow strip so I'm just looking at a, a narrow range of stellar mass around about 10, uh, 10 to the 10 and a half, so that orange strip, and that's the mass range that I'm going to focus on here. So this is a, so what I've done is I've gone off and, and uh, uh, selected a, a volume limited sample of galaxies in this narrow mass range between about two and 10, sorry, two and five by 10 to the 10. Um, and you can immediately see the problem from this corner plot is that everything's correlated with everything. And so trying to uniquely identify what correlates with what is really hard because um, everything correlates with everything. So what I, the, the, way, the, the way that I've gone about trying to combat this is first, that's the advantage of using this very narrow stellar mass range is it's a, it's, it's a cheap way or, or an almost foolproof way of controlling for mass to isolate those other trends. Then what these red boxes are showing is how I can split my sample into quartiles according to different properties. The off-diagonal plots are sort of showing how in these, you know, court, you know, quartiling things by different ways, it's showing the overlaps. And so the point you can see is, yes, there's a, there's a strong degree of correlation because there are a lot of points in the diagonals, 
but the correlation is not total. So there are a number of points in the off diagonals, which gives you some hope that you can maybe um, eke out some sense of, of which are the more fundamental parameters by looking for which parameters show the strongest trends. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm doing this with weak lensing, and I'm not going to talk about this very much. You know, I'm just going to say weak lensing is a thing that lets, uh, allows you to measure halo mass. The thing that I want to make some, the, the thing that I, I do want to draw your attention to is the points in this figure are if I bin my sample, if I, if I make stacked lensing profiles in different bins of stellar mass. And so the, the triangles are if I split my sample into three bins, the squares are if I split my sample into four bins. This is one way of, of visualizing or mapping out the trend as a function of halo mass. The yellow lines are if I don't stack. So the yellow lines are if I try and describe the full ensemble of lensing profiles according to this very simple model where halo mass is just a linear function of stellar mass. So I want to make this, the, the really important point is that the yellow line is not a fit to the data points. The data points are a binned representation of the underlying data and the line is a, an independent, qualitatively different characterization of that underlying trend. So there's just two ways of trying to describe the same thing. So the nice thing is, in this case, they give more or less a consistent picture. So you can say, well, what right do you have to fit just a straight line? Um, and my answer is, well, you know, it seems to fit. You know, it, it, it's not obviously wrong. Okay, so this is my this is my basic approach: is to try and trying to quantify the correlation between halo mass and other properties. Just to prove that this works. Um, I'm showing some null results. So there is no trend between halo mass and declination, few. There's no, train, there's no correlation between halo mass and some random value. There's no correlation between halo mass and ellipticity, which would be a, a bad thing for a weak lensing result. And there's no trend with redshift. Um, so, so that's all nice. So now let's look at real properties. And you can see this, this, the, there is a signal there and it just pops out at you. Ah, oh, no, I broke my plots this afternoon after I did an upgrade and I fixed the plots and I forgot to put them back into the PowerPoint. So um, I'm, ignore the, the distributions at the top, um, which have, have been they're plotted in linear units. So ignore the distributions at the top, just pay attention to the yellow lines. For me, the first time I made this plot, um, it's like, well, yeah, stellar color, well, you know, it sort of, it looks a bit funny, same with specific star formation rate, but pow, Cersic index just smacks you in the face. You know, that, that there is, um, uh, that, that's the trend that I find um, uh, the most compelling. Um, stepping back from that though, there's nothing really in the data that would say that this trend is really any more compelling than any of the others. So just looking at this, I can't say which one is the, the more or the less fundamental. There, there are a bunch of different ways that you can interpret the data um, that, that, you know, uh, uh, that are consistent with this data. So what, what's the next step from here? Well, sorry, and before I go to that, the, 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 the real point is we are pulling out real trends, and that shows there is some significant scatter. And in, you know, in generic terms, it's the earlier typey things that have higher stellar masses. Um, so what's the next step? So the thing that you'd like to do is, is to compare the relative strengths of these different correlations that we're looking at. And there's, the simple way to do that is just it, it basically to think about what you're doing as a change of variables from some predictor of halo mass. So like how well can I predict halo mass given Cersic index? And it's just a change of variables, so all you have to do is know the gradient, and the scatter in the one parameter gives you the scatter in the other, um, up to some correlation coefficient. So if, say, Cersic index and halo mass were perfectly correlated, then this would give me exactly the dispersion in the stellar to halo mass relation at this mass range. But if there is some additional source of scatter, what I'm getting is just a lower limit on that dispersion. Um, so the nice thing about this is, uh, again, this gives me a basis to compare the strength of the trends with different properties and with the added bonus of giving me a lower limit on the dispersion that's based on data only. So here are the results. What you'll see is specific star formation rate is not so strongly correlated um, and, and also this trend looks a bit junkier. Stellar color 
um, the, 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 this metric is about 0.2, and the data do show uh, a weak preference for um, the structural parameters of size, and especially SOSIC index, as being those parameters that are most closely correlated with halo mass. I just want to say that this value of 0.3-ish is a bit high compared to most models. So to sum up the points of this paper, um, which I should say is just about to go in, go back in after a, a, a nice referee report. And so if you're in the audience, thank you to the referee. Um, what I've done is, is to get this volume limited sample over a narrow mass range. And the reason to do that is to try and um, get away from having to deal with any of the mass dependence. The, there's a new approach to doing this weak lensing, which is fitting to the, to the unstacked shear profiles um, to, to get away from the need to stacking. And that's what lets me look at trends across the ensemble and answer these, you know, ask these slightly different kinds of questions. Um, uh, at fixed stellar mass, the sort of earlier type galaxies have higher halo masses or equivalently, they have lower stellar to halo mass, stellar to halo mass ratios. Um, the data have a weak preference for the idea that structure is more important than stellar populations. Um, and either the dispersion in the stellar to halo mass relation is directly coupled to the structure, or the dispersion is considerably larger than um, this value of 0.3 dex. And the last thing I'll say on this is just that the key to, to the, the thing that makes this possible is having the highly complete spectroscopic redshift survey of gamma um, to allow robust selection and detailed characterization of your foreground lenses. And so it's the combination of that very complete spectroscopic redshift survey and high quality lensing data that makes this possible. So um, I'm really excited for the, the taking this forward for the, the opportunities um, of waves in particular, um, and also a, a foremost hemisphere survey that I'm uh, co-PIing with Michelle Kluver. Um, I actually can't see the time here. Do I have two minutes to show one more slide? Two, one. Okay, so um, uh, going back to this idea though, so, so the whole thing is by not stacking, I can actually get, this is just a teaser, this is, this is the next paper. So I can actually, you know, the whole point of this is that I can look at the distribution. And so by looking at the distribution, I can actually fit for the dispersion directly. Now I'm still trying to think through the implications of this, but what if the dispersion is really, really high? So this is my bivariate likelihood on the, the dispersion and either the median or the mean halo mass for this, this sample of galaxies at 10 to the 10 and a half. And because the dispersion is log normal, it makes a difference whether you put a flat prior on the mean or the median, and you can argue about which one you should do. But the point is either way, the data are suggesting a dispersion that are hot, that's high. Um, and whether this is real or observational or what, I don't know. Um, but I would also like to really, so, so do keep an eye out for um, two papers that are being led by a student, Paul Gurry, um, that should come out in the next month or two, um, using just a totally different way of doing weak lensing to come at exactly this question um, from a very different avenue. Um, so uh, uh, if, I've, if I've eaten up all my time, I'll, I'll end there. Um, just to say that, um, you know, I, what, what Ben has done is to really look at the redshift evolution. Um, what Yarad is doing is to look at those physical processes and especially the connections between formation time and large scale structure. And I think this is a nice way, or, you know, a really great way to, um, to, in a totally empirical way, start looking at how things go as a function of mass in the local redshift universe. Um, and that, that it's that data led approach that I think will lead, um, you know, to the, to the, that we'll be talking about in the next three year reunion. Guys, thank you very much. I personally love this full immersion on the scatter. So if all of, all of you that can unmute could join me in thanking uh, Benjamin, Jorit and Edward. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are in the coffee break moments, but I think I would like to give five minutes uh, for discussion. Um, I apologize with those of you who actually allocated this time to other duties in the family or otherwise. Um, are there any questions from the audience, um, either by raising the hands on Zoom or on, on the Google Doc? 
Andre, you have a raised hand, I think it's from earlier. Is it correct? Yes. I, while uh, people are thinking maybe, um, I actually wanted to um, hear your opinion. So especially when we look for the causes of the correlation and because of the inversion problem in, at, the, at the peak of the sartorial mass relation and the inversion of the relationships at the high mass end that Ben and Yorit has shown um, uh, respectively, shouldn't we go after the causes by making really sure that we distinguish different mass regimes and therefore different Quentin regimes, so, you know, the correlation that you already see in the start of a main sequence uh, should be studied by themselves. And then what happens to the quenching population is probably something else yet. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this. I think we should be very careful in distinguish regimes where the galaxy populations are quite different. And I'm still thinking about centrals. I'm not sure that quenched versus star forming is necessarily the right dichotomy, though. Um, that, 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 that's a strong assumption before you go in. Um, and, and so I think, you know, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's just, it, it, you know, it's important to be mindful. So um, I think, yeah, that, that's why I prefer, you know, more, um, that, well, that's why I'm more of an observer um, and taking that, that fully empirical approach. Um, but that's my, that's my own bias. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody think if interested in this, I think there's David Weinberg again. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for uh, Jorit um, and um, related to the slide of, of the, the tracks of, uh, of galaxies in the star formation M star plane. Um, and so, so it looks, my take on that was was you're saying that the tracks are actually uh, they're not perpendicular to the plane to the the star forming main sequence, but they're at least across it. So so one one question is um, so the existence of that main sequence you know makes it very tempting to think of galaxies as evolving along it and you know compute history star formation histories as though galaxies are going along the main sequence. So I take it from your results that, well, that would actually be a very inaccurate uh, way of calculating things. Um, and then, so, so do you agree with that? But then also, you know, if, if things are evolving across the main sequence and not on it, um, then, you know, what's your understanding of why a main sequence is actually present? Yeah, so these results indeed indicate that the galaxies on long time scales are also averaged over over a over a group of galaxies. Indeed, they I mean they travel or parallel to the main sequence at a fixed time. Um, but there are different time scales. I mean, individual galaxies they can they can move up and down the star formation rate uh, on a lot of different time scales. Um, and I think the scatter in the main sequence at a fixed point in cosmic time is just reflects all those different time scales. Um, so why do we? So I think that that that, that answers your first part. I think or it addresses the first part. Um, I think David was uh, asking something that is a very big and fundamental. Why do we even have a star forming main sequence if galaxies are always evolving across it? Although, keeping in mind that the star forming main sequence moves every time. Yeah. Why do we even get a star forming main sequence in first place? Did I interpret it right, David? Paraphrase right? Yes. And, you know, maybe the answer is just things are sufficiently well synchronized as a function of mass that that the uh, that the the sequence is itself evolving um, along with things. It it just seems it it seems an impressive coincidence, particularly that the slope stays as consistent as it does uh, mm -hmm. when the the individual tracks are have have a quite different shape from from the slope of the sequence. 
However, here is really, really important that when we do this kind of averages across galaxy populations in beans as a function of time, there's no single galaxy in the simulation here in Nigo that probably goes through these tracks, which is which are average, right, Dorit? Like every galaxy actually will have a, a kind of an individual track, and indeed they all oscillate in the star forming sequence, which is an aspect on its own. So averages of what galaxy populations in evolutionary tracks are really hard to convert into individual tracks. Um, is there any other comments, uh, general comments? Um, there was Joel Primack, um, ciao Joel, uh, who brought up the question about the slides. Uh, we'll, I'm going to investigate uh, in a moment. Uh, ideally, if the speakers agree, it would be best, of course, to also place the, uh, post the PDFs of the slides online, and we'll contact you later, and probably there will be the usual links on the website. All right, guys, thank you, everyone. Uh, now it's, and thank you very much. This uh, was a great start, according to me. Thank you to all the speakers for this fantastic coordinated presentation. See you soon.